I'd like now to turn to Dr. Isam Awad, the John Harper Seeley Professor of Neurological Surgery at the University of Chicago, who will be discussing an imaging biomarker for cavernous angioma. Dr. Awad? Thank you, Erin. Uh, it, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be with this uh, group. Uh, I noticed more than 675 participants, so uh, I hope that the, the impact of our presentations will be commensurate. So I want to move a little bit to a granular level here where I discuss an actual rare disease where also the event rates are, are very rare clinically, but yet consequential. Uh, hence the, uh, the convincing need for a surrogate biomarker uh, and uh, uh, walk with you through some of the validation steps that established the biologic plausibility of this biomarker uh, and the hypothesized context of use. My acknowledgments uh, really both relate to uh, uh, two great programs at the NINDS that helped us in this regard. Uh, one of them is the uh, Trial Readiness for Rare Diseases Initiative, uh, and the other is uh, the Exploratory Proof of Concept uh, uh, Trial uh, Design. Next slide, please. So, I always find it useful when we have so many participants to really go back uh, to the fundamentals. And I find that it is often uh, confused among people when we speak about validating biomarkers uh, as to what context of use is meant and what is really our goal. Uh, so what I'm going to res respond to you today uh, basically is a response monitoring biomarker uh, that uh, can be deployed uh, potentially as a surrogate uh, endpoint to test the effects of a drug. Next. So basically what we are going to propose is that a quantitative susceptibility mapping on MRI of the brain, and I will, sure, uh, I will soon tell you what that is, uh, can serve as a monitoring biomarker of hemorrhage in a lesion in the brain known as cavernous angioma. The goal is to assess the effects of drug treatment on bleeding in a cavernous angioma that has already caused uh, a hemorrhage in the prior year uh, and hence uh, is a high risk lesion destined uh, to re-bleed. Uh, the drug effect uh, could be decreasing the QSM a change during a one year epoch, which would signal a drug benefit or effectiveness. And uh, in a two tailed analysis, an increase in QSM uh, would signal uh, increased bleeding of, uh, in the lesion and has, has potentially a concern for safety uh, or risk. So uh, the, the, this biomarker is currently being deployed as a primary outcome in a proof of concept uh, trial, and I will discuss with you that uh, use. And there is ongoing validation for multi-site use of this uh, biomarker. The consideration or the hypothesis is the potential use as a surrogate outcome uh, in phase 2b uh, trials and ultimately potentially in phase three trials for approval of drug indication in rare disease. Next slide. So the cavernous angioma, uh, th there are many vascular malformations of the brain as, as you could see here in this brain diagram, but the one we are talking about uh, is, uh, is one that is caused by uh, dilated capillaries in the brain that are hemorrhagic because of the brittle uh, nature of these uh, dilated capillaries. These develop as a result of either a germline mutation in a gene that causes these dilated capillaries or in a somatic mutation uh, of these same uh, genes uh, that uh, uh, generates the same, the same uh, phenotype. Next slide. Next slide. So this is what the lesions look like on MRI and the sporadic type will only have one lesion as a result of a somatic mutation. The familial type 
uh, have multiple lesions in the brain. And in either case, the lesion either uh, sits quiescent for a long period of time or starts developing aggressive growth and hemorrhage, which is often recurrent. So every lesion in the brain has some hemorrhage, but uh, there is a, a subgroup of lesions that acquires or turns off a switch where they become recurrently hemorrhagic. Uh, next slide. So th this uh, uh, illustrates uh, how we combine a clinical definition as well as the uh, imaging definition to define a symptomatic hemorrhage. So when you have a symptomatic hemorrhage in a cavernous angioma, uh, th that uh, has to be, have resulted from a change uh, on imaging as well as a new symptom. Why is it important to, to identify these cases with symptomatic hemorrhage? The next slide uh, shows that. So basically a lesion that had never uh, bled before, which is relatively common in the general population, more than a million patients carry a cavernous angioma in their brain in the United States. Uh, however, once a lesion has had a single symptomatic hemorrhage, we like to call it CASH, cavernous angioma with symptomatic hemorrhage, that's where the money is, it is more likely tenfold or more to re-bleed. Hence, this lesion uh, is really a target for therapeutic development uh, to try to prevent uh, re-bleeding. A CASH uh, is a rare disease uh, affecting less than 200,000 uh, patients in the United States. Next slide. So of, of these 200,000, uh, they have a very high likelihood, more than a third would re-bleed again uh, within, within five years. Those in the brain stem and deep areas of the brain are even more likely uh, to re-bleed. Uh, and uh, since brain surgery is the only current treatment to, to really get to these lesions, it is obviously very morbid and, and uh, highly costly. And we would love to, uh, to, uh, to create a, a pill that actually stabilizes the lesion and prevents the re-bleeds, uh, converting a cash lesion into one uh, that uh, would not re-bleed again. Next slide. The problem with the clinical events being used solely for drug development is that clinical events confirmed with imaging rebleed are uncommon, although they happen in a third of the patient when you have a rare disease, that number rapidly dwindles down into a very low number for clinical trial purposes. Uh, subclinical rebleeds, uh, while they can be detected on MRI, we do not know when to do the MRI to detect the subclinical rebleed since it is subclinical. And uh, the effects of a subclinical uh, bleed disappear on MRI after a few weeks. So if you didn't do the MRI uh, <clears throat> in a timely fashion to detect the subclinical rebleed, you will miss it altogether. Yet when we have a subclinical rebleed in a lesion, uh, it will re lead uh, to overt clinical rebleeds. So it is important for us to try to detect through a biomarker these subclinical rebleeds uh, so that we can uh, we can modify them. Uh, to prevent more clinical events. So a novel biomarker would be useful if it is more sensitive to bleeding in the lesions than clinical events or imaging changes alone. And the novel biomarker over a time epoch, say one year, would be helpful if it detects the cumulative impact of bleeding in lesions uh, throughout the epoch. Next slide. So there are several drugs in the pipeline for, for development based on mechanistic links in this disease, including two or three that are uh, already in clinical trials, but several others in the pipeline. So the compelling need for this biomarker is great. Next. So the biomarker we are talking about, it takes uh, MRI scans 
of susceptibility, which are the mineralization in the brain. You see the SWI scan here on the left with the black blotch. And it acquires the signal in such a way that we quantify how black this blotch is. So we turn it into a grayscale called QSM or quantitative susceptibility mapping, where each pixel on the imaging uh, study uh, can reflect the, uh, the parts per million of susceptibility in a quantitative uh, scale. So does this really reflect how much bleeding there is in the brain? So we did some studies that are quite fundamental showing that any form of non-heme iron, so whether it is F2, F3, or uh, various ferromagnetic forms of iron in the brain, uh, all of those contribute to the QSM uh, signal uh, in a, in a, a very uh, linear uh, fashion. Next slide. So if we take the, the cavernous angioma lesion itself, and as a brain surgeon, I have the opportunity to resect some of these lesions. When we uh, subject them by mass spectroscopy to total iron content in the resected lesion, the QSM value on MRI uh, is perfectly matching the amount of iron that is in the uh, biologic lesion itself. A very compelling biologic plausibility that the QSM is measuring the amount of iron in the lesion. The same is true in mouse animal models where the uh, uh, iron is stained with pearl stain. You see this crescent uh, type uh, staining and the QSM image shows the exact crescent uh, uh, amount uh, of iron uh, in the lesion. Next slide. So does that really matter uh, clinically. So if you take cavernous angiomas that had never bled before, so we call them stable, stable lesions at baseline, and we follow them forward, a very small percent of them will bleed during one year. So we call those unstable. So if we had done QSM at baseline and at the end of one year, the stable lesions, the QSM remains remarkably unchanged in a lesion that was stable at baseline and stable at follow-up. However, a lesion that uh, develops a symptomatic hemorrhage during the year uh, has a change uh, in the QSM that is a very, very tight change. And in fact, a greater than 6% uh, change uh, will achieve 100% specificity. So that if we are looking at lesions that had bled in the prior year, uh, the changes occur uh, much more greatly. So many of them will recover and their QSM will decrease during the subsequent year. And many lesions will uh, have additional uh, uh, growth uh, or bleeding. And you see their QSM value uh, in, in red in that uh, slide on the right side, in the uh, graph on the right side. But what is important here is that all the cases where we happen to detect a clinical event during uh, that epoch uh, happen to be captured by a, uh, a predicted QSM increase. But there are cases with QSM increase that do not have uh, a clinical event, and hence uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is much more sensitive. Next slide. So if we are going to do a clinical trial models, uh, with this disease. We require a large number of patients uh, in order to show an effect on, uh, on clinical bleeding. But yet, if we postulate a change in biomarker change based on these pilot data, we can detect a, uh, a meaningful and significant effect with far fewer patients. So uh, I wanna run through the next few slides very rapidly. Next slide, please. So th this trial readiness project, next slide, actually uh, allowed us uh, to enroll a subgroup of patients. Uh, can you go three slides ahead? So we have all of this, uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, 
So basically, atorvastatin uh, is a it is a repurposed drug that where at high dose it accomplishes rho kinase inhibition. Next slide. So now you see uh, here that how the effect of atorvastatin can decrease iron uh, in the mouse uh, lesions, and now we are testing it in humans with QSM as a surrogate endpoint. Next slide. In order to, to do this uh, efficiently, next slide. Next slide. The enrollment is going great. We are almost completed with the trial. Uh, we have to understand what is the actual change in the patients being followed and what is the row or correlation of change during year one and year two if we want to do a two-year uh, study. So since this has never been uh, deployed in a human uh, population before, uh, uh, this has allowed us in the context of this first trial to measure these changes. Next slide. So in fact, this is uh, data from our trial readiness and uh, atorvastatin trial. And we are able to show a very satisfactory biomarker acquisition uh, in these studies. The standard deviation and row uh, in uh, uh, this large number of epochs is exactly as was projected in our pilot data. Uh, and all cases with symptomatic hemorrhage or where we uh, captured a clinical event, in fact, had a QSM that increased by more than 6%. And we have many more cases with greater than 6%, hence showing a much more sensitive biomarker to bleeding in the brain, exactly as we would want. Uh, next uh, slide. Uh, shows the multi-site validation with accuracy, reproducibility, and repeatability at multiple sites. Next uh, slide. So the next step, this is my final uh, slide, is that if the effect of atorvastatin on this biomarker is favorable, we'll need to move to a phase 2b or a phase 3 multi-site trial aimed toward a new approved indication. Other repurposed drugs who are earlier in the development where we need to look at their safety and uh, proof of concept effect. And uh, the proposed uh, hypothesized role is can we qualify QSM in those trials? And uh, we have worked with the FDA and the letter of intent for an application is in progress. Thank you very much.